بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We continue on with the parables from the sunnah or the prophetic parables where we have been going through uh, the various parables given by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and explaining them, uh, explaining these various parables that are found in the books of Hadith. And today we continue on uh, to two other parables. These two parables uh, are once again found in Bukhari and Muslim. They are agreed upon. Uh, the first of these parables is regarding the one who pretends, the pretender, the faker, the one who you know, claims what is not true. Uh, he puts on a front. And so this hadith uh, is narrated by Asma' radiallahu anha, the, the daughter of Abu Bakr and the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَعَنْ أَسْمَاءَ أَنَّ إِمْرَأَةً قَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ لِي ضَرَّهِ فَهَلْ عَلَيَّ جُنَاحٌ إِنْ تَشَبَّعْتُ مِنْ زَوْجِي غَيْرُ الَّذِي يُعْطِينِهِ فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم الْمُتَشَبِّعُ بِمَا لَمْ يُعْطَهِ كَلَابِسِ ثَوْبَيْ زُورِ كَلَابِسِ قَوْلَيْ كَلَابِسِ ثَوْبَيْ زُورِ Asma radiallahu anha, she says that some lady came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, my husband has another wife. So is it sinful for me to claim that my husband has given to me something that he has actually not given to me? And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one who pretends that he has been given something that he has actually not been given is just like the one who wears two fake garments. Is just like the one who wears two fake garments. And so in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ warns us of a very dangerous disease that afflicts some people, which is to consider themselves as being something that they are actually not. Putting up a front, faking, pretending to have what they don't really have. Whether it be something uh, physical, tangible, or whether it be a personal trait, a quality that is within them. And so there are some people who they make it seem as if they are righteous. They put up a front. They act as if they are righteous, whereas they are not really righteous. Or they act, some people act as if they have a lot of knowledge, whereas they don't have any knowledge. They act as if they are scholars, whereas you know, they haven't studied anything. They don't have any knowledge. Uh, or certain characteristics, certain good qualities. You know, they put up a front as if they have these good qualities. But the reality is, they are just putting up a front. Uh, also, some people, they act as if they are. they have a position of authority. They have a certain status in society. They, they make it seem like that to others. And the reality is that these people are nobodies in society or they don't really have that uh, status and that authority in society. Or as we said, something tangible uh, like wealth, they make it seem as if they are rich, whereas they are not rich. Uh, or as mentioned in this hadith, 
uh, they claim that they have been given something, that someone has given them something, whereas they have not been given anything. And so here, Asma, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she tells us a story that she witnessed before her very own eyes of this woman who came and asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whether it was right or wrong to put up a front and lie to her co-wife. And we all know, you know, the relationship between co-wives who are in a polygamous, a polygamous marriage. There's a lot of jealousy there. There's a lot of, you know, natural jealousy, natural animosity between them. And so each one wants to have a leverage over the other and wants to be, you know, the more favorable wife of the husband. And so this, this woman came and she asked this, uh, you know, very honest question. Uh, she said, can I do something like this? And her, obviously, you know, a co-wife who wants to do that, the, whole, the only purpose of her doing that is to tease the other wife. There's no other reason for why she would do that. She wants to tease her. She wants to make it seem as if her husband loves her more. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so she asked, can I claim to my co-wife that my husband has given to me something, whereas the reality is that he hasn't given it to me? And so in, in some narrations, it specifically mentions wealth, mal, that you know my husband gave me, wealth. Uh, also in other narrations, it mentions uh, that it is a neighbor and not a co-wife. So boasting to, you know, a woman who boasts to her, uh, her neighbor that, you know, my husband gives me so much. He gives me this, he gives me that. Uh, you know, boasting to her, making her feel that as if, you know, your husband does not do that. Uh, so the Prophet wasallam answered her by comparing her to one uh, who wears two fake garments. Zur, someone who wears two garments of falsehood or two fake garments. So what does that mean exactly? Exactly. Uh, and so we have to understand what the Prophet وسلم, is comparing such a person to. Uh, Ibn Hajar, uh, rahimahullah, the author of Fath al-Bari, the commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, he says, the one who wears two fake garments is basically the one who wears clothing that resemble the clothing of the people of Zuhd. Who are the people of Zuhd? The people who have abstained from the dunya. Uh, and Zuhd is something that is praiseworthy uh, in the Quran and in the Sunnah. We should be people who abstain from the dunya, abstain from that which uh, will not benefit uh, will not benefit us in any way in the akhirah. And so there are people of zuhud. There are people of zuhud who, you know, when you look at them, they they wear simple clothing. They they don't indulge in the luxuries of the dunya. And so when you look at them, you say, "This is a person of zuhud." especially because of their attire, their, their clothing. And so he says, this is the one, the, 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 the one who wears two fake garments. He is the one who wears clothing that resembles the people of Zuhud to make it appear as if he is one of them, showing humility, showing abstinence more than what is actually in his heart. So in his heart, he is not a person of Zuhud. He wears those clothing only to put up a front, to fake it, out of riyah, to show off, so that the people will praise him as being a person of zuhd. Imam al-Nawawi also mentions this meaning, but he added other possible meanings 
that the scholars uh, of the past have mentioned. And so he mentions that this is one meaning, uh, but another meaning, another potential meaning of this uh uh, of this person, the one who wears two fake garments, is he says one who wears two garments that actually belong to somebody else, making it seem as if they belong to him. So these are two garments that he's wearing that don't belong to him, but they actually belong to someone else. He says another possible meaning is that this is a person who wears one shirt, but he adds additional sleeves to the shirt, to make it seem as if he is wearing two garments. To make it seem as if he is wearing two shirts. He says another possible meaning is that it is metaphorical and not literally two garments, but rather a liar who says that which actually never happens. So he says a person who wears two fake garments is basically a person who lies and says that something happened, whereas it didn't actually happen. And uh, another possible meaning, he says, is that this refers to the one who is asked to give a false testimony. And that is known as al zur the one who is asked to give a false testimony. So what he does is he puts on two garments to make him appear nice. And so when he gives his false testimony, uh, it won't be rejected. Why? Because uh, of how nice his appearance is. Uh, you know, the people won't expect a person in such a nice appearance to to lie and give a false testimony. So what do we notice about all of these meanings? What we notice about them is they all share uh, something in common, and that is uh, deception. Uh that the one who wears two fake garments is basically the one who deceives people. He puts on a front. He dresses in a way uh, to make uh, to make it appear as if he is something, whereas he is not. So deception, lying, faking, pretending, and so on and so forth. And the whole reason why two garments are mentioned here in the hadith and not one, is because such a person, he lies about himself, what he never received. You know, he claims that he received something, whereas he didn't. So he lies about himself, and he lies about others, that they gave him something that they never gave him. So the lying here and the deception is twofold. He is lying about himself and he is lying about others that you know they gave him whereas they never gave him anything uh, likewise the one who gives false testimony as we said al qawl uh, zur the scholars say that he is somebody who wrongs himself and he does wrong to the one he is testifying against so it is twofold and so in this hadith, the Prophet wasallam wanted to warn this woman from this sin because of the evil outcome of it. There are evil consequences that will result from putting on a front like this and claiming that your husband gave you something that he didn't and so what would that do if it was permissible then what would that do if she goes and does that what will it do it will cause friction and animosity and enmity between the co-wife and her husband between the co-wife and her husband uh, just like magic that is intended to separate a husband from his wife. And so, you know, magicians, they have a special magic, black magic, where, you know, somebody comes to them and says, I want you to separate between this husband and, and his wife. Get rid of the love and the affection between them. And Allah mentions this 
in Surah Al-Baqarah or in the in the long ayah concerning magic uh, in the story of Suleiman and uh, Harut and Marut. And so the point here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned this woman of the sin because of the evil consequences it would lead to. And so among the lessons that we can learn from this hadith is, first of all, the prohibition and the danger of acting like you are someone you really are not. Or to to claim that you have something that you really don't. Because this is lying, it is deception, and it causes enmity, and it causes animosity between the believers. Uh, and the Prophet wasallam said, مَنْ غَشَّنَا فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا Whoever cheats us, whoever deceives us, meaning the believers, then he is not one of us. And so this is a warning to anyone who you know, deceives the believers in any way, shape or form. The Prophet wasallam gave him this stern warning that if you do that, you are not one of us. Why? Because the believers are not supposed to be like that with one another, but rather they're supposed to be the opposite of that. As the Prophet wasallam said, that you do not uh, truly believe, you do not have true Iman until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And all of the various ahadith uh, in that regard. The second lesson that we learn from this hadith is uh, that this prohibition in this hadith of claiming to, you know, to have something that you don't, uh, this is this prohibition is general with regards to all the believers in all cases in all kinds of relationships but it is even more emphasized with respect to relations that will go nasty if someone was to do something like this like in the example given in this hadith of co-wives co-wives you know there's already that you know, tension between them and that, you know, natural jealousy is already there. Uh, also, siblings, uh, between siblings uh, and the parents, uh, also co-workers, colleagues, and so on and so forth. The third uh, lesson that we learn from this hadith is, and this is taken from this hadith, specifically with regards to knowledge and so it's unfortunate in our times that we are seeing a lot of people who uh, claim to have knowledge of Islam and they put up a front they put up a front to make it seem as if they are very knowledgeable maybe because of their power of speaking or uh, their power of writing. They're able to write very eloquently uh, and present arguments that are very convincing and so on and so forth. The point is that people look to them as if they are big scholars of Islam. And these people put up a front and they make it seem like that. Uh... And some of them, they even start giving fatawa, whereas they're not qualified to do so. They, you know, whenever there's an opportunity to give an opinion, they give their personal opinion, uh, and so on and so forth. Some people, they're not even, you know, uh, they're not even scholars or they have not even studied Islam but perhaps they have other professions they're doctors engineers scientists and so on and so forth and you'll find them speaking about matters of the deen to make it seem as if you know they're intellectuals 
and they're scholars, therefore they have the right to speak about these matters of the deen. And so, the point here is that all of these people, what they are doing is that they are making it seem as if they have knowledge, whereas the reality is that they don't. And so they are included in this hadith. They are included in this hadith. Why? Because they are not qualified. They don't even have the bare minimum of what qualifies a person to be a scholar of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us of speaking about his deen uh, without knowledge. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاحِشِ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَالْإِثْمَ وَالْبَغْيَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ وَأَنْ تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا وَأَنْ تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all of these things which are haram. Uh, open and secret fawahish, uh, indecencies, uh, sinfulness, uh, unjust aggression, to commit shirk, and to attribute to Allah what you do not know. To say about Allah what you have no knowledge. And that includes to say about the deen of Allah what you have no knowledge of. And so Ibn al-Jawzi, he says regarding this ayah, he says this verse is concerning the prohibition of speaking about the deen except with proof and conviction. And the Salaf, our pious predecessors, the scholars, the early scholars of Islam, they would be extremely wary of saying something without knowledge. And there's a famous story of Imam Malik, of how he was once asked 48 questions, answering only six of them. And saying about all the other questions, I don't know. La adri. I don't know the answer to these. And yet, Imam Malik was who he was. One of the greatest scholars of Islam. And so this shows us of, you know, this this level of humbleness that the, 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 the true scholars of Islam are supposed to display. That they are not people who feel embarrassed to say, I don't know. You know, uh, it's not a shame to say, I don't know. But these people, if they were to say, I don't know, then they would think, then the people will think I'm not a scholar. The people will think I have no knowledge. So I'm going to answer every single question. And there's a, uh, a story of uh, a scholar in the past, or he wasn't really a scholar, but he was one of these fake scholars uh, who was putting up a front. He was pretending to be what he was not. And so they say that every single question that would come to him, he would say, this, this issue, we have two or three opinions regarding it. Right? So, you know, he, he doesn't know anything. He's just making up opinions. Because, why? Because he doesn't know the answer. So he's asked questions and he doesn't know the answer. So he says, okay, uh, there are more than one opinion on this. For example, he's asked, is this haram? So he won't say it's haram, but he'll say, you know, one opinion is that it's haram, one opinion is that it's halal. And basically he wants to make it seem as if he is the scholar of Islam and he has a lot of knowledge. He knows all of these opinions of the scholars. So they asked him, they asked him, Afillahi shak? The question was, is there any doubt about Allah and His existence? So he said, the, the answer to this is, uh, we have two opinions. SubhanAllah. And so he was exposed as being a fake, as being a fake scholar. And so this is the hadith that warns us from uh, being fakers and pretenders and uh, making it seem as if we are something that we are not. We move on after that to the next parable that we have. And this parable uh, is also mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim 
it is muttafaqun alayh, agreed upon. It is basically the parable of the one who uh, gives a gift or he gives in sadaqah, but then he takes it back. He goes back on his gift that he gave or his sadaqah that he gave. And so this hadith is narrated uh, by Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal mathalu alladhi yarji'u fi sadaqatihi ka mathal al-kalbi yaqi'u thumma ya'udu fi qay'ihi fayakuluhu and in, in another narration al-a'idu fi hibatihi kal'a'idi fi qay'ihi uh, the Prophet wasallam said in this hadith The example of the one who takes back his charity Or in other narrations It mentions hiba, his gift Is like a dog that vomits And then returns to it and eats it Like a dog that vomits And then goes back to his vomit and consumes it, eats it. And so the story behind this uh, hadith is mentioned in non- in other narrations, and that is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was once gifted a very beautiful and fine horse, and so he gifted it to Umar radiallahu anhu. And Umar radiallahu an, he didn't really have much of a need for it. So he thought, how can I put this horse to use? And so he thought of no better way of putting it to use than to send it off uh, for jihad. Fi and so he gifted it as, you know, a sadaqah. Uh, as a gift or a sadaqa to one of the muhajirun who happened to be poor and didn't really have uh, anything to go and participate in jihad with. So he didn't have any uh, ride uh, and he didn't have anything to, to go and uh, participate in the jihad. So Umar radiallahu an, he gifted it to him and he said, you know, take this. And he wanted the reward because perhaps he did not go on that particular uh, mission. So he wanted the reward of participating in jihad. So Umar radiallahu an, he gave it to uh, this sahabi. When that sahabi returned from uh, the battle, because he was poor, he couldn't afford to take care of this horse, you know, to take care of it, to maintain it, to give it, uh, to give it uh, food, and so on and so forth. So it started to weaken. As a result, the horse started to weaken because of a lack of nutrition. So the Sahabi he said, you know, let me go to the market, and perhaps I can sell it to someone who can afford to take care of it, and you know, bring it back to its health. And its strength And at the same time I'll benefit You know I'll get some money uh, To support myself Because you know He was poor So he went to the market And he was selling it uh, And Umar radiallahu an noticed Umar radiallahu an He saw him And he noticed that This was a horse that I gave him And now it's being sold And he realized that it's it's being sold for a very cheap price, uh, not what it was worth. And so Umar radiallahu an, he decided to buy it himself. And you know he thought, let me buy it and uh, take care of it and bring it back to what it was. Uh, and then maybe after that I could send it off in jihad again. And so until here, the story until here, what do we see is 
that everything is cool and the intentions are clean the intentions are sincere right this sahabi he's poor you know he could uh, benefit from selling this horse he himself is not uh, able to take care of it he doesn't want to harm it and Umar radiallahu anh, he's thinking well you know uh, let me buy it and take care of it and you know it's a win-win situation but then Umar radiallahu anh, he thought you know there's something fishy here something's not right here this is the gift that I gave I gave this gift, it was for the sake of Allah. How can I take it back? And so he was confused. So he went to the Prophet wasallam, and he asked him. And so the Prophet wasallam, he told him, Ya Umar, don't buy it. Do not buy it. And then he wasallam, said what he said in this hadith. That the example of the one who gives, he said to Umar, the example of the one who gives a gift or a charity, and then he takes it back, is like the dog that vomits, and then returns to it and eats it. And so the Prophet ﷺ, by giving this parable, he was basically warning us of how evil, how despicable how disgusting and vile and immoral it was to give something as a gift or as a sadaqa and then to ask for it back to ask for it back to take it back even if even if the way you were taking it back was completely permissible such as in this story with regards to Umar radiallahu anh, he didn't go to that sahabi and say, give me back my horse. No. He saw that it was being sold and buying and selling is permissible in Islam. You know, as we said, everything seemed to be completely cool and, you know, completely permissible. It's simply going to be, that I'm going to buy this, you're selling it, I'm going to buy it, what's the harm in that? And yet, the Prophet ﷺ said to Umar what he said and gave this parable and this example. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ started the parable by saying, لَيْسَ لَنَا مَثَلُ السَّوْءِ He said, the evil example, the evil parable is not for us, meaning the believers. Meaning, as Ibn Hajar uh, he says, uh, meaning that it is not befitting for us Muslims to be described with such a vilifying, despicable description in which we are being compared to the lowest of animals, in the lowest of its conditions. You know, and uh, in the Arabic language, if you want to give a, a very um, a very bad parable, you would compare something. Uh, there are two animals that you know are always be are always used to give bad examples: the donkey and the dog. The donkey and the dog, and and both are used in the Quran to give evil uh, examples. In Surah Al-Araf, we have the parable of the dog, uh, and in Surah in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, we have the example, the parable of the donkey. Uh, and then Ibn Hajar he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ مَثَلُ السَّوْءِ وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى That for those who disbelieve in the Akhirah is an evil description مَثَلُ السَّوْءِ Whereas for Allah belongs the highest description Meaning the kuffar are given the worst of descriptions and anyone who acts evil, he is given an evil description. And then Ibn Hajar, he says, perhaps this example that the Prophet ﷺ gave, perhaps this is more explicit in putting off 
a person from doing such a thing. And more proving of the prohibition of this act, then if he sallallahu alayhi wa was to say, simply do not take back your gift. So he, he says here that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa could have simply said to Umar, Oh Umar, don't take back your gift. But he added this, this description. Uh, and what an evil description it is. Why? Because the one who will hear that, he'll be disgusted. And he won't ever want to do such a thing. He won't want to ever go and take back his, his gift or his sadaqah. Uh, and so here, the question is, why is taking back your gift uh, or your charity uh, so evil and vile? Why did the Prophet ﷺ have to uh, emphasize on how despicable it is, how disgusting it is to do such a thing by giving such a disgusting example? The reason is because uh, giving a gift or giving in sadaqah, it's not like any other transaction uh, where you give something in exchange for something else. You buy something in exchange for a price. But rather, when you give a gift or you give in sadaqah, one side, one party, is doing a favor to the other. And the other is not giving anything in exchange. And so when the one who gave the gift or the sadaqah, he asks for it back, the other person, he doesn't really have anything that he could give, or he doesn't have anything that he could ask in exchange. So it's not like, you know, you bought something from the store, and a few days later, you said, I'm going to go and refund it. And so you go to the store, you give it back in exchange for the money that you paid, right? Here, that's not the case. Here, that's not the case. And so this is why the Prophet ﷺ forbade it and gave such and showed us how evil it is to do such a thing. Because you are putting down the other person. You're really, really putting him down that you gave him a gift and he took it into his possession and he's using it for example and then you come to him one day and you say give it back to me it's gonna really really make him feel bad uh, and so this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not only forbade it but then gave such a such a uh, vile and you know uh, such a despicable and disgusting uh, parable an example and so among the lessons that we learn from this hadith and this parable is first of all uh, just like we have parables in the Quran and in the Sunnah to encourage us to do good deeds uh, we have at the same time parables that make us to want to stay away from evil deeds and so we have covered many parables, both in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned certain good deeds by giving us beautiful parables. Uh, at the same time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us parables uh, of certain good deeds and certain good qualities and certain people uh, by comparing them to certain beautiful things. And so we have many of these that we have covered uh, in our series, Parables of the Qur'an, and also uh, what we have so far covered of the parables from the Sunnah. And all of these are supposed to encourage us to do those good deeds and to encourage us to be like those righteous people. At the same time, though, we have parables that have been given uh, regarding certain sins and certain evil qualities both in the Quran and in the Sunnah uh, and so for example uh, in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us uh, the parable of the one who 
uh, indulges in riba, backbiting, that he is like a person who uh, eats the dead flesh of his Muslim brother or sister. That's how evil it is. That's how vile it is. And notice how Allah gives this evil description, this very nasty description. Imagine yourself eating the dead flesh of your Muslim brother or sister. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us such a, an evil description? You know, to, to make us vomit, to, to make us, uh, you know, uh, to feel disgusted uh, just for the sake of it? No. The reason is so that we are disgusted and therefore we will never do that thing. That is the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us such examples and also Allah and also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving us such examples as we have here in this hadith. Uh, the purpose of it is to, to make sure that we are deterred from it, that we don't do it. And so this shows us that we are allowed, that we are allowed uh, to use such uh, nasty examples. Uh, for this particular purpose to deter people from falling into that sin because if we don't then you know if we were to just say uh, this is haram don't do it that's not enough sometimes we need we need that you know uh, that, that scene that image in our minds that will deter us and so I'm sure all of us uh, who have learned this hadith today, I'm sure none of us would think twice about a gift that we give or a sadaqah that we give for the sake of Allah and we go and ask for it back. Why? Because now we have that image in our minds of a dog that vomits and then goes back and, and, and eats his vomit. It's nasty. I don't want to be like that. And so this shows us that, you know, when the Qur'an or the Sunnah uses such examples, uh, that there's a reason for it. You know, there, there's a purpose behind it. The second lesson that we learn from this uh, hadith is that uh, giving a gift or a sadaqah and then, you know, going back and taking it back is completely haram. It is haram based on this hadith. Uh, however, the scholars have mentioned certain exceptions to this rule, uh, such as uh, if you gave a gift, you gave a gift to somebody, but he has not yet possessed it. It has not come under his possession. For example, you tell somebody, I'm going to give you, uh, you know, a gift. I'm going to give you... Uh, I have a cert I have a watch. I'm gonna gift it to you uh, tomorrow or whenever. Until you give it to him, until it comes into his possession, you are allowed to withdraw. You are allowed to uh, go back. Obviously, it's not something nice to do. You promised him, and so you should fulfill your promise. But you don't come under what has been mentioned in this hadith. And so the scholars say that uh, a gift that we are not allowed to take back is the one that has been given and it has come into the possession of the other person. Another exception that the scholars make is that the gift, it comes back, it comes back to you through inheritance. So, for example, you gave a gift to your mother or your father or your brother and they pass away and it's time to distribute the inheritance and it just so happens that your share of the inheritance includes that gift and so it comes back to you so the scholars make an exception here because you know you didn't go after it but rather it's your it's your share that has come back to you uh, the other exception that they make uh, uh, and this is a very, this is commonly mentioned when uh, the scholars comment on this hadith, is the father who gives 
a gift to one of his children. And this is based on the explicit words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he said, it is not permissible for the Muslim to give a gift and then take it back, except for a father regarding what he has given to his child. So these are the explicit words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, making that one exception. And there's another hadith in this regard, and that is the hadith of uh, Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu. He, he mentions that when he was young, his father gave him a certain gift. And so his mother went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and complained that my husband gave Nu'man uh, a gift favoring him over, over his siblings. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, spoke to him and asked, is that what you have done? He said, yes. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told him to take it back. Take it back and treat your children equally. So he took it back. Also, uh, the, the reasoning behind this, you know, why is it, why is this the exception that the father can take back what he has given to the child? This is based on uh, uh, the fact that the father owns his child. You know, the father, his child is his possession. And anything that the child owns is his possession. Based on another hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said to, uh, to uh, one of the companions, he said, uh, أَنْتَ وَمَالُكَ لِأَبِيكَ that you and your wealth belong to your father. You and your wealth belong to your father. And so uh, these are some of the exceptions that the scholars make regarding uh, the prohibition that has been mentioned uh, in this hadith. The third and final uh, lesson that we can derive from this hadith and this parable is that it is haram to consume your vomit. Yes, it is something nasty that, you know, who would want to do such a thing? And that was the purpose of mentioning this parable. But as a a ruling of fiqh, it is haram. And uh, the scholars base it on this hadith. Qatada, one of the tabi'een, he says, uh, I do not know vomit to be anything but haram. Meaning, uh, to, to uh, eat your vomit. Uh, it is haram uh, because this is something disgusting uh, and nasty. Now, somebody he may think, well, what if I ate something which is uh, halal, completely halal uh, and healthy, uh, and then I happen to vomit? I vomit it out, it out for whatever reason. Uh, is it not therefore permissible for me to, to take it since it was halal? Its origin is halal. Its origin is not something haram. It's not like I, I ate pork or um, drank alcohol. And so to answer that, we would say no. It's haram because of you know what it is now. It's haram because of what it is now. It comes out, the way it goes in, it goes in halal and you know, wholesome and delicious. But the way it comes out is nasty and filthy. Just like we say it is haram to drink your urine or to eat your feces. It doesn't matter how it, how, it doesn't matter, the origin of it doesn't matter. What matters is, is what it has become. And and so this is what we learned from the, uh, these are some of the lessons that we learned from this uh, hadith. With that, we come to the end of uh, tonight's session, and insha'Allah Taala, we will um, continue next week. Until then, Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wa sallillahu 
وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته